Hey, what's up guys? I'm just going to take this opportunity to explain how some of the parts of Tetris actually work. Um, a lot of them are really cool. I spent a lot of time on it, so why not, right? Um, this is the color-coded version I have on my server. I don't actually just build an iron block. So yeah, it, I do color code, I swear. <laughs> so, this purple is what's being displayed on the screen. These are just kind of like mini displays to resemble the screen. So the purple is what's on the screen. And then the red and blue are like the internal parts of the machine. So we have the red part, whatever is being displayed on the red gets displayed on the purple. And then same thing with blue. So if we have something over here, it also gets displayed on the purple. So that's how those work. So the purpose of these two types is to have one section for things that are moving and one section for things that are permanent. Um, so the moving section is in charge of the pieces, obviously, because the pieces are falling and they're moving left and right. And then the blue is in charge of, well, as soon as the piece hits the ground and becomes a permanent part of the screen, we save it to this section because it's not moving anymore. Um, so the way we actually move stuff physically is, if you didn't know, you can use locked repeaters, which is a repeater powering another repeater in the side, and you can depower them for a small amount of time, and it can shift the signal over. So say that's your piece, and this is like your, you know, move left button, and it moves the piece over. So it's the exact same mechanic for move left, move right, move down, it's all the same stuff. And yeah, so let's say we, we're just starting a new game, we spawn a new piece, so it looks like that. And that's what the screen is showing me right now. So the game starts, it starts falling. You know the drill, it goes down like this, all the way down until it hits the bottom. Now as soon as it hits the bottom, the collision detection goes off and it tells it to save it to the screen. So now we're gonna save whatever's in here and just put it into here. And then we're gonna clear it from this section because it's not moving anymore. So now we're left with this. We have nothing in the falling section we have the board so far in our save section, and this is what the display shows. So let's spawn a new piece. Let's spawn a new piece like this, and it displays on the screen. It falls as normal, and then it's going to hit this piece. So as soon as it goes down here and hits that piece, the collision detection goes off again, and it becomes a permanent part of the screen. So we get that signal, and the signal says, hey, detection went off. I need you to save whatever's in the falling section immediately to the save section and just clear the falling section again. So that's the very basics of how it works. And I showed you how the shifting works for the falling. For the save section, we just use a very small memory cell. Um, it's just a torch going into another torch and you can shift between the two. So basically if you hit this button, it saves it, right? That's something saved to the screen. If you need to clear it when you're starting a new game, then you hit this button and it clears it. So there's one of these for every pixel. So now let's talk more about what actually happens inside the game. So the first thing that happens when you start a new game, besides clearing the board from last time, is it spawns a random piece. So the way we do randomness is with um, a hopper and a dropper, and it's got a sword in it and a redstone dust in it. Sword is like stackable, or no, sword's not stackable or whatever. It, it gives like a different signal strength output when you have a comparator next to it. So when these droppers are powered, it, it gives a random 50-50 sword or redstone into this hopper. And then depending on which one it chooses, this comparator either reaches this repeater with a signal strength of two, or it doesn't with a signal strength of one. Um, so after all three of these are powered, we're gonna get a three bit binary number, either, you know, 000, 001, and that binary number represents our piece. We have seven different pieces, you know, 000 through 111. I know that's actually eight, but I think one of the pieces is just doubled up. Anyways, that binary number re resembles our random piece, and that's where we get to these yellow lines here. So I'm gonna generate a piece, and you can do that by hitting this button, probably, maybe. Yeah, so we did get a random piece. It came along on one of these yellows, and each of these yellows is attached to a group of more lines. And you can probably guess what that group is. It's all the different rotation states of that piece, right? Because we don't just have one thing we need to display for each piece. I mean, for the square we do, but for everybody else, I mean, the line has two different states. The T's got four different states. The, Z, the L's got four different states. So, uh, so what random piece did we get? We got a Z. And if you look over here, this giant thing is actually just the, the memory bank that lets us, you know, choose what piece we want to show. So we got a, you know, backwards Z I like to call it. And you can see it right here. It's these lamps that are on. 
So within its group, it's got two different states. And if we hit that rotate button, and I think you can just use this to rotate it, yep. It switches over to the next variant because it's in this loop here and it's just getting shifted over and it just loops around for as many times as you want to rotate. So now, if you look at what the memory is displaying, it rotated the Z. I mean, it didn't actually rotate, it just, it just flipped to another line of ROM, but you know. So if you rotate again, it goes back to that first variant. And yeah, you get the idea. So let's clear it and spawn another piece. Clear. And spawn piece. This time we got a T down. Okay, these ones are cool. So there's our T. Just like before, we can rotate it. And it shifts into the next variant. So yeah. So as soon as you're happy with your piece, you hit that drop piece button on the input and then your piece gets put into the falling section. And this is the falling section right here. It's this dark blue. So the gray is responsible for shifting to the right. I think the green is to the left and the brown is down. So the way we do those three is just like before I showed you with the repeater locking. This pink just is usually locking this repeater and the output of it goes into the input of the guy to its left, the guy to its right with this green, and the guy down by one with this brown. And now each of those lines, the green, brown, and gray, are all being canceled with a comparator right now. None of them are being allowed through. But depending on which way you want to shift, left, right, or down, that's what you do. You, you unpower the comparators for whatever way you want to shift. If you want to shift down, you just unpower all of these comparators right here on these brown lines and then all of the signals will be sent down one layer. So same exact thing on the left and right and yeah. So once you're happy with your piece and it starts falling, we immediately need to talk about collision detection because it could hit something right away, you don't know. So you gotta have a collision detection built in everywhere. And that's what these lines are for. So the red is the downward collision detection, it's detecting if there's something directly under the piece at any time. Orange is for the left and yellow is for the right. So it's really not that complicated. It's really just a giant AND gate. It's literally just detecting, hey, are any of the pieces on our piece uh, directly above something on the permanent part of the screen? And if so, this line lights up. And these are actually instant repeaters to be even faster. And that's so it powers. It tells us this red line tells us when we hit something, basically. Same thing with the orange and yellow. So the orange is connected to all the ones to the left of it. So if, if our piece at any time is right next to something on the left that's on the permanent part, then it's just a giant AND gate and this orange gets activated. So then obviously the last part is the permanent part of the screen. That's the second half with the light blue. And you can see, like I said, it was like a torch into a torch, right? Somewhere, yeah, right there. So that's what this is right here. It's a torch into a torch, and that's what this kind of memory cell thing is for. And then this light green is just taking all of these and bringing them into the display. So the next big part of this is the cyan wool. It doesn't look like a huge part of it, but it's responsible for all the line clearing. And yeah, it took a really long time to kind of figure out how to do that, just because I didn't really know how. Like, I just kind of had to think about it like for all the different cases right so when you when you clear a line and shift stuff down it seems simple but you have all these weird cases where like sometimes you have a line on one and three and then in that case some things get shifted down by one and some things get shifted down by two depending on how high they are it's like you have all these different cases and it's just it's just kind of crazy but the main thing I want to talk about is that, um, well, there's different ways to do it. Some are a lot more time consuming than others. The quote easiest way to do it is to um, just manually check four times to see if there's a line. And if there's a line, clear it and move everything above it down by one. And yeah, you just, you just do that four times. And that's what I did at first. And then I realized that it's really, really, really slow because you're waiting as if there's four lines every single time, even if there's not. Even if there's zero, it'll still check four times. And that's just, it just takes a lot of time. Like it works, but I wanted something faster. So what I did instead, and I thought this was pretty smart, is this first uh, science spiral right here actually counts how many lines we have first. 
And then, based on how many lines we have that are full, then it decides what we need to do. That way, if we have zero lines, which is, you know, most of the time we have zero lines, uh, it can detect that, and it will know that we have zero lines, and it'll just skip the entire line clearing process completely. Because we don't have any lines, so it just skips it. If it counts one, then it just clears the line once. If it counts two, three, or four, then it, it goes accordingly. And that's why these circuits here get longer and longer, because these are the different cases. This is if we have one, two, three, or four lines that we need to clear. And the last major part of this is the brains of the Tetris. So this is called the sequencer. This just kind of handles like everything at once. <laughs> I mean, all these different lines are different colors and they all resemble different things. I actually have them all on signs right here. So like, you know, the yellow would save the board to the memory. So it would like take the falling stuff and move it into the uh, save stuff. You have all these different functions you need to do. You need to add points, clear the score, spawn a piece, rotate piece, you know, open up the moving section, clear lines, start the start the clock for falling. There's all these different things you need to be able to do. So what I did is I lined up all the things that we need to do. And these are just all the functions of Tetris. And then I made a little chart for what needs to happen at each um, stage of the game. So I have stage zero, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Um, stage zero is when you first like press start game and it just basically gets everything ready for you. Stage one is when the piece is at the top and it's not moving but you can rotate it. So these are just the two colors of things that we need to do during stage one. And the way it translates over to this white thing is these four white lines are the stages zero, one through three. So as so you can see right now, this one's depowered and this is actually stage one. So stage one has certain torches attached to it, and those torches are coded for the lines that we need. So you can see up here, stage one has green and light gray, which translate to open up the moving section and show the piece ROM. <laughs> so we have torches attached to the light gray and the green so that it does what it needs to do. As soon as we drop that piece and it goes into stage two and it starts falling, it does these three things. One of them being the brown, which is starts the clock for falling. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, this is the brains of Tetris. Like I said, it's the sequencer. It just handles out, you know, it, it gives all the jobs to everybody and it keeps the game going. If you ever need to reset it, like it makes it way easier because you can just reset it to stage zero and yeah. So that's how the sequencer works. So yeah, that's pretty much it. The only thing I really need to say is that the scoring system was not made by me. I did not make this at all. This is all credit to Mazuma Games. I think I'm saying that right. He's got this seven segment um, switcher thing here. It, it just works so well. Like I honestly didn't even make an attempt to understand this. I just slapped it on here. Like amazing job to him. I don't even understand what's going on here. I mean, I see comparators. I see barrels with different amount of signal strength in them. And yeah, definitely sub to him. This is really awesome but with that we're pretty much done i've been talking for so long i'm literally about to lose my voice um i've had to record so much it, it's really hard to like summarize all of this down but I try my best and uh if you got any more questions of course you can just join my discord the world downloads in there too so have fun with that and hopefully you learned something thanks for watching